He said something like this. I know people say I'm a pessimist, but I don't believe I am naturally. I like a lot of things so much, but I could never get over the idea that it would be better for us to be without both the pleasures and the pains, and that the best experience would be some sort of sleep. I have always had a weakness for arguing with anybody, and this involved all that contemporary nihilism against which I was then in revolt. And for about five minutes, in the publisher's office, I actually argued with Thomas Hardy. I argued that non-existence is not an experience, and there can be no question of preferring it or being satisfied with it. Honestly, if I had been quite simply a crude young man and nothing else, I should have thought his whole argument very superficial and even silly. But I did not think him either superficial or silly. For this was the rather tremendous truth about Hardy, that he had humility. My friends who knew him better had confirmed my early impression. Jack Squire told me that Hardy in his last days of glory as a grand old man would send poems to the Mercury and offer to alter or withdraw them if they were not suitable. He defied the gods and dared the lightning and all the rest of it, but the Greeks would have seen there was no thunderbolt for him, because he had not hubris or insolence. For what heaven hates is not impiety, but the pride of impiety. Hardy was blasphemous, and he was not proud, and it is pride that is a sin, and not blasphemy. I have been blamed for an alleged attack on Hardy, in a sketch of Victorian literature. It was apparently supposed that talking about the village atheist brooding on the village idiot was some sort of attack. But this is not an attack on Hardy, this is the defence of Hardy. The whole case for him is that he had the sincerity and simplicity of the village atheist, that is, that he valued atheism as a truth and not a triumph. He was the victim of that decay of our agricultural culture, which gave men bad religion and no philosophy. But he was right in saying, as he said essentially to me all those years ago, that he could enjoy things, including better philosophy or religion. There came back to me four lines, written by an Irish lady in my own little paper. Who can pitch the scene at the starry portals? Truly, imagination fails, when the pitiless president of the immortals shows unto Thomas the Prince of the Nails. I hope it is not profane to say that this hits the nail on the head. In such a case, the second Thomas would do exactly what Prometheus and Satan never thought of doing. He would pity God.